Good morning all and welcome to today's presentation with Asia Answers, Escape to Malaysia and Singapore. Now we are six months into 2017 and we've covered a number of different countries in Asia. Many are standalone destinations, many are dual destinations. I believe today the two that we're going to see, Malaysia and Singapore, work ideally as a dual destination, especially for people that may have a short period of time, maybe a week or only 10 days to go and see some fascinating cities and countries throughout Asia. Malaysia and Singapore sets that up perfectly. With that being said as well, these destinations are also a perfect stopover and a great introduction into the Asian way of life. Of course, they're also a great little stopover for those maybe heading down to the South Pacific. Of course, now, Malaysia and Singapore. Now, separate countries, Singapore was once a Malaysian state. In 1965, when it was announced that Singapore would become independent, many predicted that the tiny island nation with no natural resources would actually fail. 52 years later, Singapore has overtaken its motherland to become one of the richest and most developed countries in the world. And I can attest to this being there many times over the last 10 to 15 years. Singapore has achieved such a rise and it is always a topic of hot discussion among economists and also political analysts around the world. Of course, for the traveller, however, it's all good news. The two destinations are now diverse enough to make exploring both of them a rewarding and also an experiencing uh, something firsthand that you may not see anywhere else in the world. We're going to begin today's presentation by featuring Singapore. Located at the tip of the Malaysian Peninsula, Singapore aspires to be a city in a garden, and what Singapore sets its sights on, it normally achieves. While its skyscrapers and ultra-modern architecture might initially lead to one to believe that Singapore is a concrete jungle, after a few hours on the ground, one is struck by Singapore's abundance of parks, nature reserves, and of course, lush tropical greenery. The city itself blends Malays, Chinese, Arabs, Indian and English cultures and religions all into one. And this is a classic shot of some young gentlemen out on the street in and around Singapore celebrating their lives. Its unique ethnic tapestry affords visitors a wide array of sightseeing and culinary opportunities from which to choose. Now there's a full calendar of traditional festivals and holidays celebrated throughout the year which adds to the cultural appeal. And this is something that we can help with our destination specialist to ensure your clients get exactly what they need when they go to Singapore. In addition, Singapore offers luxury hotels, as we can see from this classic shot. Of course, anywhere you travel in Asia, and Singapore is definitely right up there, there's delectable and outstanding cuisine, and of course, a great shopping, one of the things that Singapore is well known for. Of course, the Island Republic's excellent infrastructure enables visitors to enjoy its many sites and attractions in a safe, clean and green environment. Award-winning Changi Airport provides air links to major cities around the world. The train and subway systems are clean, fast and efficient. In addition, its state-of-the-art cruise terminal has established Singapore as one of the premier cruising centres of Southeast Asia and an exciting port of call on all Asian cruise itineraries. Now this is something I would like you to remember. If you do have clients that are looking at doing cruises, obviously a lot of the time when they finish in a destination, Singapore obviously being a great place to finish or start a cruise, we can help set up a pre and post cruise option. Maybe it's just three or four days. We're doing a lot more of this and I want you to make sure you remember this when people are booked onto a cruise for you because I know a lot of you out there specialise in cruises and then you have land components either side of that. That's where we come in for Asia, the South Pacific, and of course, Africa as well. Now, any country that we go through throughout Asia, we're always looking at the geography, because geography can often tell you a lot about the best things to do, but it also tells you a little bit about the history uh, of the region as well, just because of the landscape. Now, lying one degree north of the equator, the Republic of Singapore is located at the end of the Malaysian Peninsula between Malaysia and Indonesia which you can see right here. What I find absolutely amazing is the size of Singapore. Yes, it's relatively small. Singapore has a total land area of only 277 square miles. But interestingly enough, it is larger than it used to be. 
I hear you ask, how does that happen? Well, Singapore has, has reclaimed land with earth obtained from its own hills, the seabed in neighbouring countries. As a result, Singapore's land area has grown by a massive 20% since the 1960s and aims to grow another 20% by 2033, so in about 16 or so years. Itself, in regards to looking at the size of Singapore, comprises a diamond-shaped mainland and 58 smaller islands, which you can see sprinkled here in and around the south. The mainland of Singapore measures around about 31 miles from east to west, so easy country to get around. And of course, it also runs 17 miles from north to south. The capital city, also called Singapore, covers about a third of the area of the main island. Singapore is separated from Indonesia by the Singapore Strait and from Malaysia by the Straits of Johor. Now, many of the countries throughout Asia have huge mountain ranges. Well, Singapore is a little bit different, but I want to make sure you know about it. The highest point of Singapore is Bukuk Temar Hill, which is a massive height of 538 feet. It's something that I'm sure we could all scale 538 feet. Of course, Singapore has no natural lakes, but reservoirs and water catchment areas that have been constructed to store fresh water for Singapore's water supply. And just to let you know, in the past, Singapore also bought water from Malaysia. When we talk of the history of Singapore, according to legend, Singapore was founded centuries ago when a prince from Sumatra landed on the island and saw a lion. He took it as a good omen and founded a city called Singapura, which means Lion City. The legend may or may not be true. In fact, the name Singapura was not recorded until the 16th century, and Singapore was really only a small trading post. Modern Singapore was founded in 1819 by Sir Stanford Raffles. I'm sure we've all heard of Raffles. A governor with the British East Indy Company who believed that the British should establish a port on the Straits of Malacca and decided on, yes, you guessed it, Singapore. Singapore was initially leased and then purchased outright from the Sultan of Johor. Now, the British established a new trading post at Singapore and it grew rapidly, as well as Europeans, Malays, Chinese, Indians and Arabs came to live here and also work here. Now, of course, when the Suez Canal was built in 1869, Singapore became even more important as a gateway between Europe and Eastern Asia. Now, in January 1942, the Japanese conquered Malaysia. And on the 15th of February 1942, Singapore was forced to surrender. Japanese rule was absolutely out of control. Thousands of Chinese Singaporeans were executed. And when Japan surrendered, the British reoccupied Singapore. And after 1945, Singapore slowly moved towards independence. Self-government was granted in 1959. And in 1963, Singapore joined with Malaysia. However, as we've established, the union was short-lived. Singapore left in 1965 and became completely independent. Because of its efficient and determined government, Singapore has become a flourishing country that excels in trade, tourism, and is a model to developing nations around the world. Of course, getting to Singapore is quite easy. We have a number of different preferred partners, one of those being Cafe Pacific, which flies by Hong Kong, another great little stopover, maybe for two or three days. Check out Hong Kong. For those who love rugby, they have the Rugby Sevens there. And for those that are looking for you know, a little bit of shopping, maybe somewhere they've never heard too much about, check out our preferred partner, Eva Air, and their Hello Kitty planes. They stop off in Taipei on the way. And I was there just earlier, uh, I was there six months ago or so, and we had a great time in and around Taiwan and Taipei. You know, the food was exquisite, and some of the landscape was absolutely astounding in the south of the country as well. Of course, once you've continued on from your little stopover or jumped off your preferred carrier, you arrive into Singapore. Now, the question is, when is the best time to visit Singapore? Since the city is only 60 miles from the equator, the tropical temperatures do not vary too much at all. Singapore has no distinct seasons, realistically. Rainfall is throughout the year. But if you're looking at trying to avoid an area when you may get on a time of the year that may have more rain, that is between November, December and January, which is often referred to as the monsoon season. Now, the temperature throughout the year is always a very, very comfortable, 72 to 95 degrees. So it's definitely a place that you can get away with your shorts and your T-shirts. 
unless obviously you're visiting uh, various monuments or going into uh, religious houses. And we can discuss that as we create your itinerary for you as well. Now the hottest months are April and May, and as we mentioned, since they are so close to the equator, no distinct season, it does have high humidity most of the year. Some of us absolutely love that humidity. It reminds me of a little bit back uh, when I lived up in the north part of Australia. Of course, religion in Singapore. I find this absolutely uh, amazing. Singapore is the world's most religiously diverse nation, which is great, with Singaporeans following various religious beliefs and practices due to the country's diverse ethnic and cultural mix. And just look at all of those different people there from around the world standing in their you know, distinct regalia. Of course, when you break down the religion, 30% of the population practice Buddhism, 11% of the population identify as Christian, and 14% as Muslim. There's also a number of people practicing other, you know, more minority uh, faiths as well. But they, as you can see from this pie graph, they are accepted and everybody's having uh, a very positive time in Singapore. Now, language in Singapore. English is the main language spoken by Singaporeans and the language of instruction in all schools. This makes Singapore one of the easiest Asian countries to visit as foreign language guides are not necessary. And of course, there is four official languages though, English, Malay, Mandarin, and Tamil. Now, as we've discovered, as you travel throughout Asia, food is very important. Probably no more important on any other continent in the world, you know what I mean? Africa is known for, for its wildlife. Asia, I think, gets itself established because of its food in different regions, and also the quality and the diversity of food. Singapore is a hot pot of cuisines to eat, incorporating a rich heritage of food dishes consisting of Chinese, Indian, Malaysian, and Indonesian influences. Some of the most popular dishes are the following. Hyanese chicken rice, steamed chicken served with rice cooked in chicken stock. This all-time favorite dish makes for a quick, fulfilling lunch. The quality of chicken stock is crucial to this dish, and you can tell by the steam rice oozing with flavor and also its fragrant aroma people are blown away. And of course, pour some dipping sauce over the chicken to give it a go. It just really sets it off. Of course, there's also chili crab. Hard shell crab cooked in semi-thick gravy with a tomato chili base. The steamed crabs are partially cracked, then lightly stir-fried in a paste comprising of chili sauce, ketchup, and eggs. Despite its name, chili crab is not all that spicy. Bread is normally ordered to soak up the gravy, so dig in with both hands and enjoy. We then have laksa, rice noodles in spicy coconut curry soup with shrimp, fish, eggs and chicken meat, a cross between Chinese and Malay cuisine. We then move on to the barbecued stingray. I wonder who's tried that. Write it down if you've tried this. I'd love to know what it tastes like. This is one of those things I haven't tried. Originating in the streets, Barbecued stingray has become a popular seafood dish served at hawker stalls. The classic version features stingray meat slated in thick sambal sauce, which is a spicy condiment with diced tomatoes, chilies, and shrimp as a base ingredient. And then it's wrapped in banana leaf to be cooked slowly on a grill, similar to what you can see here. We then move on to, yes, the ever-famous fish head curry a huge fish head and vegetables cooked in curry and served with rice or bread, usually accompanied by a glass of a local uh, beer or wine, or maybe even just a local lime juice. It, uh, its origins are in South India with Chinese and Malay influences. So in some versions, tamarind juice is added to give a sweet sour taste. But as you can see, a melting pot of cultures and therefore a melting pot of cuisine. Key places to visit in Singapore. Singapore has been described as a playground for the rich, and it's true that the small city-state does have a certain sheen of wealth. But Singapore offers more than just high-end shopping malls, luxury hotels, and fine dining. There is also a vibrant history and diverse ethnic quarters to discover, along with the many family-friendly attractions and lovely public spaces. Singapore has an excellent public transportation system that makes getting around convenient and easy. Once you've gotten the sense of the metro map, you'll have no problem zipping from one part of town to the next. And as we mentioned, English is spoken throughout, so very easy to communicate. One place that you will definitely want to check out, and maybe if the budget allows, is to stay at the Marina Bay Sands. 
The opulent Marina Bay Sand Resort complex includes a hotel, high-end luxury stores, a mall with a canal running through it, the Art Science Museum, and the Marina Bay Sand Sky Park. Yes, a vantage point for taking in the entire city. The Sky Park viewing deck and infinity pool are found in the ship. Yes, you heard it correctly, the ship that tops the hotel. Only hotel guests are allowed to use the infinity pool, but anyone can visit the observation deck. Another place from which to get a bird's eye view of Singapore is the Singapore Flyer, the world's largest giant observation wheel. Choose from several different packages that allow you to be served and pampered while enjoying a view that encompasses not only the Singapore skyline, but reaches out to the Spice Islands of Indonesia and Malaysia's Strait of, of Johor. There are several different ticket packages to choose from, and each includes the multimedia journey, multimedia journey of dreams. It's an exhibit that delves into Singapore's history and the creation of the Singapore Flyer. Now, the flight itself normally takes around about 30 minutes and runs from early morning until late evening. So you can choose which view of the city you want to enjoy. The beginning of another bustling day, or when Singapore is aglow after dark. I think the one at night looks spectacular. Once you've glimpsed this beautifully designed green space, what you won't be able to stay away, the gardens by the bay. This, you can wander through the bay, these gardens, perfect for enjoying the vibrant plant life and escaping the city's bustle. You won't want to miss the super tree grove where you'll find a cluster of the iconic futuristic structures designed to perform environmentally sustainable functions, which you can see here. Then head to the Cloud Forest Dome to see the world's tallest indoor waterfall and learn a bit about the biodiversity of this region. The Botanical Gardens. Not to be confused with the gardens on the bay, the Botanic Gardens are also worth a visit. Singapore received its first UNESCO World Heritage nomination for the Botanic Gardens and with good reason. The city can sometimes feel like a concrete jungle. Albert a clean and comfortable one, but the Botanic Gardens preserve pieces of Singapore's wilder heritage. Indeed, you can visit the Gardens heritage trees via walking trail, which is conserved as part of an effort to protect the city's mature tree species. Of course, make sure to visit the impressive National Orchid Garden as well. And other attractions include an eco garden, eco lake, the bonsai garden, sculptures, and several other gardens in unique sites as well. Of course, if you've ever visited China, Singapore's Chinatown neighbourhood will bring you right back there. From the small mum and pop stores and authentic Chinese food to the bright red lantern. There's an excitement and hustle in this district. You can visit the Chinese Heritage Centre and see the impressive and beautiful Siri Maraman Hindu Temple. Another temple worth visiting in this area is the Buddha Tooth Relic Temple. And if you're up at 4 a.m., that's right, at 4 a.m., you can hear the morning drum ceremony. Or you can just check out the closing ceremony in the evening after the viewing of the relic. Heritage markers have been installed throughout the neighbourhood in English, Japanese and simplified Chinese so visitors can better understand the significance of the area. One of the most exciting aspects of Singapore is the diversity of its neighbourhoods. Yes, the country is a savvy shopper's paradise, but you'll also find rich tradition, delicious food, and local character in its older quarters. Nowhere is this truer than in Little India and Arab Street, also known as the Arab Quarter. The Indian community has a rich history in Singapore, and this enclave dates back more than 200 years. Singapore's name actually derives from the Sanskrit word for Lion City. Now, as we mentioned, according to Little India's official website, today the neighbourhood is a thriving, colourful place where traditional holidays are celebrated and visitors can observe worship and activity at the temple or purchase saris while mingling with local vendors. This colonial and famous building, Raffles Hotel, is one of the world's last grand 19th century hotels and was once visited by literary luminaries such as Renard Kipling and Joseph Conrad as well as movie stars such as Charlie Chaplin. Built in 1887, the Raffles Hotel has served as a Singapore land park for well over a century and continues to live up to its Tony reputation with excellent food and service. The classical architecture and tropical gardens provide a refined setting and represent another facet of Singapore's varied and rich history. The Raffles Hotel is located in Singapore's colonial district, 
also home to several other historic sites. Among them is the Raffles Landing Site, where Sir Stanford Raffles is said to have stepped ashore in 1819. Let's not forget about the Changi Chapel and Museum. Singapore was not spared the horrors of the Second World War, and the Changi Chapel and Museum tells the story of those who suffered under Japanese occupation. The museum displays the letters, photographs, drawings, and personal effects that are now testaments to the imprisonment of more than 50,000 civilians during this time. Now, the Chengi Chapel found in, in the open-air courtyard of the museum is a replica of one of the many chapels that were built during the Second World War. It stands as a monument for those who would not fold under the Japanese rule. Singapore Zoo bills itself as the world's best rainforest zoo. The Singapore Zoo is a very impressive place. The facility is clean and very inviting, and the animals appear well treated with plenty of lush vegetation and habitat space. The orangutans are particularly impressive, and visitors can watch as babies and adults alike swing high above their platforms and snack on a banana or two. There is also a large chimpanzee family, zebras, meerkats, Komodo dragons, mole rats, white tigers, kangaroos, and many other creatures as well. You can have an opportunity to hand feed the animals as well. A place that I visited when I was in Singapore, and a place that I remember very well, was Sentosa Island. Singapore isn't exactly known as a beach destination, but if you're really craving some fun in the sun, Sentosa Island is the place to find it. Salosa Beach is a good spot for getting in beach time, and visitors can play volleyball on free court, or go kayaking, or even try skimboarding. There are several other beach attractions as well, plus an underwater world aquarium where you can swim with dolphins. Of course, a must-see on Sentosa Island is the Merlion, Singapore's famous statue that has the head of a lion and the body of a fish. You can take an escalator to the top of the statue and enjoy panoramic views of the surrounding area. Of course, one of the most famous areas, districts, is Orchid Road. It is a great place to start a shopping spree as there are high-end stores at every turn. You'd expect nothing less from a neighbourhood that boasts 22 malls and six department stores. There are also four movie theatres, including an IMAX and KTV karaoke. If you get hungry while burning through all that cash, there are plenty of eateries in the neighbourhood serving international cuisine as well. Now, Clark Key is the centre of commerce, was the centre of commerce during the 19th century. It lives up to its legacy and is also now a busy hub. Today, it has a more polished sheen to it though. So long after a day of shopping on Orchard Road, visitors can happily head to Clark Quay for an evening of waterfront dining and entertainment. River taxis called bum boats and cruisers also depart from here. One of the most majestic buildings is the Empress Place Building, which was constructed in 1865 and built in the neoclassical style and was named for Queen Victoria. It now houses the Asian Civilizations Museum which delves into the many Asian cultures that helped form modern day Singapore. For a look at what life in Singapore was like before it was all glamour and skyscrapers, visit Granite Island. The National Parks Department calls a trip here a throwback to Singapore in the 1960s, and I believe is a must to learn a little bit about the past. Where people live, it is a simple villages, farming and fishing as ways were in the years gone by, often referred to to as a simple life. Following today's presentation, we will be sending you out a perfect stopover in Singapore. As I mentioned, we think this is an ideal place maybe for four days, three nights, and we have a great package, $849 per person based on a double occupancy, which includes breakfast daily, accommodation, you also get to go on a bum boat tour, and you get to travel the old way with a tri-shore and Singapore, Singapore sling tour as well. But let's have a little bit of a look at that itinerary and some of the sites that you will see. On day, way, day one, you'll arrive at the airport and you'll be transferred to your accommodation on arrival. A time to acclimatise and then to rest. Day two, morning tour of Singapore from the river by bum boat. This will give you a great overview of the city and also just a way to immerse yourself into the local culture. Then you'll be out exploring, driving through the civic district, which you can see here. And on the way, you'll pass Padang, which is sporting fields right there, as you can see, in the heart of the city. The river system, the downtown area, so to speak, or the sky rises, and then obviously these football fields, cricket fields, tennis courts, it's all there, right in the heart of the city. 
And along the way, you'll pass Singapore Cricket Club, and what an amazing sight that is, especially from an Australian point of view, as we love cricket, and you may even see some locals, expats, uh, playing a game of cricket. This is one of those things. I love checking out local sporting events. Doesn't matter where I travel in the world, I'm a sports lover, and I love when you're in different countries, and no more so here in Singapore, because you have countries from all around the world, especially having that British influence as well. You'll see you know, people from India, obviously Australia, yeah, England, England, and other, and other countries, countries that have also adopted, adopted the game, the game uh, uh, trying, trying it out. It out. And you may you even may be able, able to participate. participate. You never know. Of course, of course day, day two will continue as you pass by the Parliament House, House, the Supreme Court and City Hall, the Buddha Tooth Relic Temple, as we mentioned mentioned before, and you'll also have an opportunity to take in the National Orchid Garden within the Singapore Botanical Gardens as well. And then on day three, you're going to explore Singapore's top attraction, Gardens by the Bay, which you can see here, which is a great aerial shot looking back down towards the downtown region and also, obviously, inverted commas, the big Ferris room. Gardens by the Bay, a unique complex with two biospheres housing an unbelievable array of flora. The architecture of the complex is cutting edge. And then, of course, You'll have an off afternoon to relax a little bit, and then at day four, leisure until your transfer to the airport for your onward flight, maybe somewhere else in Asia, or maybe for your departure back home. We now move to Malaysia, a country that I believe works as a perfect destination to combine on a trip to Singapore. Malaysia is a two destinations though in one as its own country, and offers extreme contrast. So let's have a look at it. On one on side of the side South China, China Sea are Malaysia's futuristic city of Kuala Lumpur, Lumpur, which we can see here, and also Penang Island. Island. Then, then on Malaysia's Borneo side, side, you'll find some of the most unspoiled and vividly beautiful places on Earth, with places that have waterfalls, exotic plants, and of course, also one of the biggest flowers in the world, the Rafflesia. Let's not forget, forget, also in Borneo, you, you can find Southeast South Asia's highest peak, peak Mount, Mount Kinabula. And from here, here you'll be able to get, able to get some of the most majestic views, views looking back over, over the top of the country. country. Along the way, in and around this part of the country, you'll also have the opportunity to go and visit Sepalok Orangutan Sanctuary, where orphaned and injured orangutans are rehabilitated to return to the forest. You'll be able to get that iconic shot of, you know, obviously the orangutans participating and communicating with you, or maybe just lazing around in their own little wheelbarrow. They certainly are a barrow full of mischief and fun. The geography of Malaysia. Of course, on one side of Malaysia, as we mentioned, you've got Kuala Lumpur, uh, Kuala Lumpur or KL to the west. As you go across the South China Sea to the east, we have Malaysia and obviously the Borneo part. So one side, a little bit more commercial, you know, all your high-rise buildings, and then to your east, your beautiful natural wonderland of the environment and delving into a variety of different ecosystems as well. Now, when we speak of the history of Malaysia, we have to go back to the 19th to the 13th century and we talk of the Buddhist king, uh, kingdom. And then we jump forward to the next door arrival, which was the state of Malacca, which was ruled by a Muslim prince and began to the spread of Islam in the area. However, it wasn't until the first Europeans to arrive who were the Portuguese that they then conquered the Malaccas in 1511 and then would take control of the area for over a hundred years. The area would change hands to the Dutch in 1641 and then to the British in 1795. While the British were in control, they developed the industries of rubber and tin production and Malaysia was occupied by Japan during the Second World War. However, soon after the war, the country began to move forward towards its independence. Getting there, there are no direct flights from the US to Malaysia, but Asia Answers can offer our preferred partner of Cafe Pacific or Eva Air, or for those that may be looking for an extended journey throughout the world, how about looking at Emirates? As a, with an add-on in Dubai, especially for those people that are flying maybe from the East Coast or anywhere in the United States for that matter. Dubai is one of those places that is becoming more and more popular and a lot of the times two or three days there before you continue on to somewhere in Asia, in this case Malaysia, will just work perfectly and also gives you that great uh, opportunity to compare and contrast two different parts of the world. Of course, of course, when you when touch you down, down into Malaysia, Malaysia you're probably going to be asking yourself, have I come at the right time of year? Well, let me tell you, folks, 
Malaysia's climate, climate is tropical, tropical with high humidity, you know, you know realistically, realistically all year round. round. It's, it's an area that usually has temperatures around about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So very, very pleasant, very comfortable. comfortable. I would actually say a little bit warm. Oh, and however, the rainy season, as we mentioned, similar to Singapore, November to the February. Religion. Malaysia is a multicultural country whose official religion note is Islam. 61% of the population practices Islam. You're looking at about 20% percent practicing Buddhism and about 10 percent Christianity and as you can see from this pie graph a number of the smaller minority religions as well are featuring throughout the country. As we've seen throughout cuisine is very popular regardless of where you go in Asia however you talk to any Malaysian who lives abroad and one thing they'll say that they miss most about Malaysia is the food. Malaysian food is delicious the colors are irresistible uh, as are the aromas. Malaysians are not wild about the formal settings of restaurants when it comes to a local cuisine, so the following dishes are more likely to be found at markets and at street cars. The first one we're looking at is the banana leaf. Now, in a banana leaf rice, white rice is served on a banana leaf with an assortment of vegetables, curried meat or fish, pickled, and the super addictive pabadum. This meal can get messy since it's traditionally eaten with the hand, so dig in, folks. We then have VKT. The name literally translates as meat bone tea. And at its simplest, it consists of fatty pork ribs simmered in a broth of herbs and spices such as star anise, cinnamon, cloves, dong wai, fennel seeds and garlic for as long as possible. We then move on to hockey and meat, something that I absolutely adore. Chinese style fried yellow noodles. It's a cult following in KL, Kuala Lumpur. It is a dish of thick yellow noodles braised in thick, dark soy sauce with pork, squid, fish cake and cabbage as the main ingredients and cubes of crispy fried pork lard used as garnish as well. Something we've all seen around the world is a satay. Satay is a close relative of Japanese yakitori and Turkish shish kebab, meat on skewers, skewers over a barbecue. Basic yet effective, served with spicy peanut sauce dip slivers of onions and cucumbers, and of course, rice cakes as well. Now, Kuala Lumpur city folk will drive two hours to Penang just to satisfy this beautiful uh, meal. They're yearning for delicious freshwater prawns, butter river prawns, which are simply mouth-watering, which we can see here. Number of key places to visit in Malaysia. Affectionately known as KI, Malaysia's sultry capital is a mishmash of historic monuments, towering skyscrapers, traditional street markets, and ultra-modern shopping malls. A booming digital economy is driving development and inspiring contemporary artists to produce international quality work based on a century's old melting pot culture. Of course, in KL, eating is the number one pastime, and the streets are fragrant with pungent spices, enticing visitors and locals alike to take a break and have a bite. Of course, you'll also want to check out Penang. It is an island off the northwest side of the peninsula, famous for its pristine beaches, fishing villages, and British colonial architecture. Georgetown, the capital of Penang, is a city of Eurasian contrast. Trishaws and Chinese shop houses sit comfortably beside cathedrals and fish and chips bars. So yet again, a melting pot of cultures. Malacca is now one of the most popular tourist destinations in Malaysia. Whilst in this region, you'll definitely want to check out Jonker Street Night Market, which buzzes with tourists from all over the world. It also has some of the best local dishes in all of Malaysia. We now look at the Lakawara Archipelago. It's made up of 99 islands in the Andaman Sea to Malaysia's west coast. The islands are naturally beautiful. White beaches, jungle-clad hills, and verdant rice fields. It's all about relaxation in this part of Malaysia. Sabah occupies only a small part of Borneo, yet it is so rich in natural beauty and offers so many diverse activities that it is a complete destination. Sabah is a treasure trove of coral fringe deserted islands. Of course, there's also Mount Kinabulu, 13,000 feet in height, and there's lush jungles all around. And whilst you're in the jungles, you may see some of these amazing little creatures. And of course, let's not forget the gibbons, the pythons, the clouded leopard and the crocodiles, which make this area their home.
The bar's compact size make it easy to get from highlight to highlight, and its British heritage means that English is widely spoken. We now look at Mount Kinabula. It's the tallest mountain in Malaysia and the 20th tallest in the world. Mainly because of the biological diversity, the mountain is listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Climbing the mountain is not easy feat for the untrained, though it will absolutely be one of the best experiences ever. Watching the sun rise in the early morning will definitely make you forget all the hardships you had to endure during the hike up. We now look at Sarawak, and this is, allowed, this is an area that allows visitors to spot, yes, you guessed it, orangutans, and then also the famous proboscis monkey, and of course, yet again, the crocodile. And when you're talking about flora and fauna, when you're in this part of the world, who can forget the world's largest flower, the Rafflesia? All on a day trip from Kuching, Borneo's biggest and most livable city. You'll be able to go and visit a place such as the Calabit Highlands and see the Longhouse. To get there, a journey would be made in a flying coffin, which is a riverboat, which is also always required whilst you're visiting Malaysia. Now, we have a package which will be sent out yet again following today's presentation, a perfect stopover in KL, Kuala Lumpur, four days, three nights, and it's only for $299 per person. It's got private airport transfers, you know, a full day highlights of KL with an English speaking guide, and then you've also got three nights accommodation and breakfast at the hotel. You certainly can't go wrong for that price. We're now going to show you a few of the sites that will be taken in on this beautiful little short tour of Malaysia, a perfect stopover in Kuala Lumpur. Day one, You'll be, you'll be taken from the airport to your hotel. And then on day two, you'll get the opportunity to start to explore KL's most interesting and diverse sites. Tight, tall highlights will include the Patronus ta Twin Towers, I think made quite famous during the movie of Entrapment, but obviously also a symbol that is well known around the world and one of the tallest buildings anywhere in the world. Of course, you'll also get to visit the Handicraft Centre, maybe pick up a, a souvenir uh, of a traditional way of life. Check out the King's Palace, one of the most majestic and you know, structurally sound buildings you'll see anywhere in Malaysia. And look at this for an absolute gem. There's one of these, this is one of those places that no matter what angle you take it from, the photo is absolutely going to be second to none, the Sultan Abdul Saman building. You'll see a number of different national monuments. You'll also get to visit the National Mosque visit the market, and of course, as we mentioned, you'll also have an afternoon to go out and visit a Malay village visit. On the way out to the village, you'll visit such places as the pewter factory. As we mentioned, pewter is very famous in and around this region due to the British uh, past. Of course, you may be able to step inside and see people you know, doing their traditional trade, using their, you know, their hands to go into the intrinsic details that go to create these beautiful pieces of pewter. And there's also the Batak factory, where you'll see the ladies working uh, on various instruments to make these amazing designs. And you never know, you may be even able to pick up a souvenir or two. But the day doesn't finish there. As you go out and visit the Batu Caves, and when you step inside, you certainly will be amazed. What a full, fun-packed day. And then on day three, you have a, a leisure to enjoy the many attractions and activities in and around KL. Now, I spent a couple of days here, and I was absolutely astounded by the quality of food that I was able to get by jumping on and off the buses as I toured around. And we can arrange a number of different touring options for you whilst you're here. And then on day four, you're at leisure until you are transferred to the hotel for departure. Something that I would like to mention at this point, especially for those that are considering a trip to uh, Singapore and Malaysia, how about adding on one of our train journeys, Eastern and the Oriented Express Rail Journey. It's a four-night, three-day package, which we'll be also sending out to you. I know many of you have clients out there always asking about you know, world-renowned train journeys, and this is one of them. There is no better vantage point to explore Southeast Asia than aboard the luxurious Eastern and Oriental Express. Your passport to the exotic and the sophisticated. A luxurious private cabin is a stylish sanctuary for your trip, with windows perfect for watching the scenery unfold. You'll share experiences with fellow guests over cocktails and dinner. You'll visit exotic sites and luxurious destinations where you'll meet local characters from elephant handlers to wine experts. On day one, you'll depart from Bangkok, and there you'll settle back 
into your private cabin as the train rolled through Bangkok City to the countryside. Dinner is served in one of the luxurious dining cars where you'll be able to meet you know, uh, other people that are travelling with you or maybe just a romantic dinner. And then afterwards, head to the bar car to relax with fellow travellers or retire to your cosy, coveted hotel. Uh, cabin, sorry, not hotel. Day two. After breakfast, disembark at the River Quai Bridge Station for a leisurely cruise along the river guided by a local historian. Later in the morning, join a visit to an evocative war museum and optional war cemetery as well. You'll then return to the train and look forward to an exceptional lunch and dinner, just a time to relax and take it easy. Moving on to day three, spend the morning watching the changing scenery as the train travels through Malaysia. After brunch, arrive at Kuala Kangsa, where you'll disembark for a tour of the Grand Ubuda Mosque and also the Royal Museum of Perak and the Sultan Shah Gallery as well. You'll step inside and you'll be blown away by some of the you know, costumes and the traditional wares of this part of the world. And then rejoin the train for a refreshing cocktail accompanied by a live piano music before a glamorous final dinner on board. What an absolutely great experience. Arrive into Singapore for your own onward travel arrangements or maybe for our you know, couple of days in Singapore package.